Hello and welcome to History 391. Today I want to talk about the years immediately following Vietnamese reunification. Our reading earlier in the week by Trong Nu Tang gave us some fantastic insight um, into what it's like, you know, being a Vietnamese person who isn't happy with what ends up happening, not because he's pro-American, in fact far from it, he was very much, you know, part of the struggle against the Americans and prior to that would have been anti-French, but as someone who was frustrated with what happened after the fall of Saigon in 1975 and the subsequent reunification of the country. So what's going on? I mean, I think a large overview would be this, was that, is that um, economically it was far from a walk in the park that um, victory over the Americans did not guarantee an easy route for the Vietnamese state in the years following. Um, and there, was also, there were also larger geopolitical questions to be thinking about as well. So problems with reunification, as we saw in Tang's reading, there was kind of a, a, a tendency among the North to effectively not really to kind of reunify North and South as two components back into a third different thing, but to take what was successful in North Vietnam and apply it to South Vietnam, in effect integrating the South of Vietnam into an existing Vietnamese system. Now, there are lots of reasons that you could you could see why they'd be sympathetic to this or why they would want to do this. I mean, first of all, if you go back, as of course Vietnamese nationalists would and have every right to do, to seeing the um, Vietnamese independence becoming a real political legal thing, in 1945 with Ho Chi Minh's declaration of the state, there is this sense of continuity and there is this sense that the DRV in North Vietnam is not just the inheritor to this kind of legacy, but is a, 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 is a persistent existing, uh, you know, practice of what Vietnamese nationalism, Vietnamese independence, Vietnamese government, the Vietnamese state actually is. So, uh, on an ideological level, on a political level, it would make sense to incorporate the South into this existing model, which of course assumes that this existing model works and is functioning really well. It's hard to know if it was functioning well or not, I would say, in their defense, because they've been at war for 20 years, um, and really have been at war for even longer than that, in all, at all intents and purposes. So, um, you know, what's it going to look like in peacetime? They don't know yet. There's an additional layer to this as well, of course, which is, you know, communism. So communism is a very utopian concept, a very utopian idea. And although many in the West, including people like Henry Kissinger, were prone to see communism as just kind of, you know, window dressing for dictatorships and other kind of state actions and minorities taking control of, the, of their countries, and there was some truth to that too, that at least the communist parties themselves claimed to care not just about controlling society, but where society was going to go. And communists are very kind of, they're very social science -y. at least the communist activists and intellectuals tend to be, in formulating very specific processes and very specific ways of doing things. And this, this goes all the way down to, um, you know, uh, um, appointing local officials and determining, um, you know, specific policies in terms of acquiring, you know, food and other goods and things like this. I mentioned the command economy very, very briefly in the last video, you know, this was a classic concept of 1970s statist communism, that the government would uh, be able to ascertain the appropriate demand and in fact, and, and therefore, um, you know, mandate the required supply. And in a Western kind of point of view, this is a classic example of everything that was wrong with the communist systems, that it, that it limited individual choice, that it led to austerity, and in fact, it led to poverty in many cases, that it led to an inability to get a hold of these goods. And the long version of that story is that the West wins that argument, and I make this joke all the time, but you know, miniskirts, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, um, and the Beatles had a lot to do with the Cold War being won in the end, and the collapse of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. But in the 1970s, this is not something your average North Vietnamese communist is terribly interested in. And so, in addition to believing that the South should be integrated into the North because that's just the way that you do things the way you're used to it, um, there's an ideological impetus, a, a requirement to do that, that, well, we can't do a different system in the South because the system we have is the correct system. It's the morally correct system. It is the historically correct system. You know, Karl Marx was very... Um, insistent on making very specific historical arguments for socialism, um, and, and this is the way that it has to go. And, and so for all these reasons, it's, it's kind of understandable why um, they would do such a thing. Now, 
There's problems with this in the sense that South Vietnam and North Vietnam are different places. They have been governed by different states for decades at this point. And although those different states, the, the states of the South, were arguably politically illegitimate, they have been ruling over various structures or even lack of structure that is unique to the Southern Vietnamese experience and is different from the Northern Vietnamese experience. Going back to the Geneva Accords in 1954, um, you know, when you see all these people coming south from the north and very, very, uh, very, very few going up to the north from the south, there's an existing policy by the Vietnamese communists to um, to uh, crush dissent and to punish those who are seen as being against the central story. Now, this was happening in South Vietnam as well, um, but kind of the inherent chaos of the South Vietnamese political situation meant that it was different and complexity and chaos was kind of part of the part of the deal in the South. And in the North, this had kind of this had largely been stamped out. I bring all this up because one of the, the one of the kind of the key points, the key failures of the integration of South into the North is collectivization. Now, collectivization was um, kind of the the large scale kind of a high profile example of 1950s, 1960s, 1970s global communism, which in effect was to go out into the countryside to erase or massively minimize the concept of personal property and instead basically take all the food producing territory and make it, you know, um, managed by the state. Why would you do this? You would do this if you were a diehard, if you were a socialist, if you genuinely believed this was the best economic way to produce food for the country and everything else. But it was also a land reform project. It was a way to take land away from landlords who in many cases had been very badly behaved, had been criminally behaved, had had, had let people die and had evicted entire families and been terribly, terribly badly behaved. Um, uh, collectivization was a way to, to take the land away from these wealthy people and give it to poorer farmers in a very Marxist and very Maoist idea, Chairman Mao in China, to take the land away from those who simply owned it for, you know, perhaps because through flukes of generations of elite, of elite privilege and everything else, and hand it to those who worked the land. Like in concepts, actually lots of very attractive ideas about it. In practice, it could be quite violent. In practice, establishing who should be the ones to relinquish land and who should receive it was a very thorny topic and unfortunately very open to corruption, lots of issues with it. And collectivization had kind of been forced through in the north, but in the south reached pretty significant opposition and was a real problem. And you start to see massive amounts of Vietnamese and also ethnic Chinese Vietnamese flee the country and start leaving the country. In addition to this, there's significant um, um, natural disasters and famines in 77 and 78. And, um, you know, it, it, except for the most diehard, fervent, pro-communist figures, at least if you're talking about things like, you know, food on the table and, and basic economic concerns like this, it, it's very difficult to find uh, people in the south of Vietnam who could honestly say their lives are better um, in 78 than they perhaps were in 73. Now, there's a huge but to that, which is they were living on, in a war-torn regime in the early 1970s. And certainly the leaders of South Vietnam were but in no way, shape or form um, morally uh, morally admirable people or um, economically capable people. So you'd be kind of careful there. Um, but certainly reunification doesn't magically fix those problems. Geopolitically then, there's kind of an interesting question going on. There's the kind of global context and there's the local regional context. Regionally, Vietnam is part of what we typically call Indochina. So it's Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And the French had, although, you know, Vietnam comes to exist as a kind of a modern concept um, shortly before and then under French domination, the French had certainly looked at the whole kind of peninsula, you know, the whole region um, as kind of being one kind of coherent group. Um, the Vietnamese and the Cambodians in particular have quite a complex relationship. Uh, the Vietnamese, the Cambodians rather, um, are very... Um, wary and concerned um, that the Vietnamese are trying to dominate them and effectively treat them as a puppet state. Um, and they were right. That's exactly what the Vietnamese were trying to do. Uh, in 1970, Sihanouk, who had been um, a kind of a, a, a um, kind of a pro-American or, or an American sympathetic um, type figure. He had been deposed in a bloodless coup in 1970 and by 1975 you see the emergence to power of a group called the Khmer Rouge who are communist, although they kind of don't cop to being communist exactly. They're led by a man named Paul Pot. Um, they're very scary. They bring in very, very radical, very radical communist, Maoist specifically, uh, policies. And they go after with a vengeance anyone seen as an enemy of the state in the name of Pol Pot. And a further, at least a million Cambodians die from overwork or malnutrition. It's considered one of the, you know, they talk about the Killing Fields, very famous film. Um, 
people have called it autogenocide, the murder of many, many, many Cambodians by other Cambodians. Uh, it's, it's a horrific regime. And they also renamed the country of Cambodia to Kampuchea. And in, um, the Khmer Rouge are largely, and this is where the regional and the international kind of meet, the Khmer Rouge are largely Chinese allies, whereas the Vietnamese Communist Party and the Chinese are not getting on all that well at this point. And late in 1978, the Vietnamese choose to invade Cambodia. Now, they end up being broadly successful, and they depose the Khmer Rouge, and Cambodia for the next 10 years is effectively not a puppet state of the Vietnamese, but certainly very friendly to the Vietnamese, and the Vietnamese have a heavy role um, in Cambodian foreign and domestic policy. Um, the Chinese in early 1979 are very frustrated by this, and they invade Vietnam, and they kind of basically take a few cities along the northern border, and the war ends and, you know, people have sadly lost their lives and both sides claim victory and not a lot terribly changed. The Chinese perhaps could argue now that they had shown the Vietnamese that they couldn't rely on the Soviets to protect them. And that's a big element in what's going on in Vietnam. The deterioration of the Vietnamese and Chinese relationship um, is kind of, there's a lot of things going on here. The Vietnamese and the Chinese traditionally had a difficult relationship. The Vietnamese tended to see, view the Chinese rather um, suspiciously or, or carefully, let's say. Um, you know, there's a long history of the Chinese kind of effectively trying to, you know, certainly in the language of the mid to late 20th century, to colonize China. And as you could understand, and as you saw in our source this week, you know, your average Vietnamese nationalist in the 20th century is very, very um, wary of that word colonize, and for good reason. And so there's this sense that the Chinese really want the Vietnamese, expect the Vietnamese to be this kind of little brother, super friendly state on the doorstep kind of a state. So the Chinese and the Vietnamese have this very kind of difficult relationship. Also, the Chinese and the Russians have an increasingly difficult relationship. It's been very fractured since the early 70s, since the late 60s, really, and it's continuing to be a major problem. Um, there's even the phenomenon of Chinese troops on the border between the Russians and the Chinese. You know, you go back to the 1960s, the domino policy and everything else, the domino theory, I'm sorry, and everything else. There's this sense that, um, you know, well, the Chinese and the Russians, it's all one big communist camp. By the 80s, this isn't really true anymore at all. And the Chinese and the Russians have all kinds of problems. So the Vietnamese and the Chinese having issues brings the Vietnamese and the Russians close together. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Chinese could feel out of this invasion of early 79, they had shown that, you know, the Soviets couldn't defend the Vietnamese. Who knows whether it's true or not. The Russians pour a lot of money into Vietnam to support the Vietnamese. They actually have a naval base in Vietnam that had previously been an American naval base. And partly with the help of Russian money, the Vietnamese military swells to over 1.2 million um, members, making it the fifth largest military in the world by the end of the 1970s. But the catch, of course, is that the Vietnamese are entirely reliant on the Russians and Eastern Europe for their economic existence and the well-being of their people. Their relationship with the Chinese is very, very difficult indeed, and China's going through its own things we might reference um, in a future video. And of course, this is not least a problem because things are going to change very dramatically in the 1980s as various communist societies attempt to reform in various ways, particularly economic. What will the Vietnamese do? Well, the short answer is they will also seek to reform economically. And we'll come back and we'll talk to that soon. But I think the kind of to sum it all up, I, I kind of want to get into our discussion question for this video, which is how do we evaluate Vietnamese independence and reunification in the context of the late 70s, of the years immediately following um, the unification of Vietnam and how do we how do we contextualize it and place it in this context of larger Vietnamese history it should be the realization of the dream right an independent Vietnam finally finally Vietnam belongs to Vietnamese people this is what Vietnamese people have been fighting for literally and figuratively and, and, and literary in literary writing literary texts and writing you know forming organizations and and putting their lives on the line and many you know many millions of Vietnamese lost their lives uh, many of them willingly for this dream of independence and they're they're met with regional problems domestically within Vietnam itself, regional problems in Indochina, massive geopolitical obstacles um, and, and extreme economic hardship. So the question is not so much was it worth it, but but how do we as historians, what does that mean? How do we understand that? How do we frame that in the context of all the decades that came before? Now. The next couple of videos, we're going to come back to the American side again, looking at American counterculture and kind of the American experience of the war and in kind of a popular culture level. And also uh, Robert McNamara, who'd been secretary for um, defense under uh, Kennedy and then Johnson, and his famous, uh, his famous kind of retrospective look at the war. And so we're kind of bounce around 
for the rest of the term. And, and these are kind of the big questions we face is like, what does it all mean and was it worth it? What did it mean on the American side and what does it mean on the Vietnamese side? So uh, hopefully that'll be, be interesting. Thank you for watching.